uh, I am a, I'm a Danish philosopher. Um, and uh, I guess it's better to be honest and say that I have never spoken to this many educators uh, at the same time before. I don't have any experience um, working with uh, educators. Um, I have a background uh, as a, uh, an educator myself at the university while I did my PhD and my postdoctoral studies. But, but other than that, I am uh, very uh, inexperienced in uh, in in teaching and uh, in, in learning um, uh, the learning business. So I hope you will help me. Um, and, uh, and I think it would make better sense maybe for Maha at some point to tell you why she invited me uh, <laughs> being this stranger. Um, but I guess it's because of my work with questions. Uh, I have spent the past uh, 20 years uh, doing research on the nature and impact of questions. Um, from a philosophical point of view, but also um, from a, a practical uh, point of view, uh, working primarily as a facilitator uh, within organizational development and leadership and um, strategic transformations for large organizations. So it's just to give you an idea of, uh, of my background. But, but through all of it, I have been um, on a mission uh, to democratize the power of questions. Um, I think very much of questions as a very powerful uh, phenomena and something that um, that we tend to monopolize. I'm doing it right now, uh, deciding what to talk about and what questions to answer. I didn't even give you a chance to ask any questions yet. Uh, I'm just talking. Uh, and we do it uh, in a lot of situations, uh, monopolizing um, this extremely uh, powerful um, ability. So I'm on a mission to democratize the power of questions, and I actually think I will uh, start right away and say before I, um, I move on and telling you what I have planned for us today, um, I would like all of you to uh, write down a question, not directly in the chat, um, but on a piece of paper or uh, on your phone or whatever you have, write down a question, um, and it can be about anything as long as it's relevant for this community for my fest and what we're doing together and it's important for you to receive an answer um, these are the only two rules so if I could get you to write down a question that would be really nice and I will give you a few minutes um, because it can take a few minutes to reflect and come up with a question So for those who just came in, uh, Pia has just invited us to privately, not in the chat, privately write a question. And you're saying a question that we have for this community or for MyFest and a question where we actually want to know the answer, but we're not yes. going to ask it to anyone right now. So, so when you mean privately, you mean like in the chat, I send it to Pia? Do not put it in the chat. Keep it on a piece of paper or a document privately to you. Okay. So men, let's welcome. So and uh, I, I had to do it manually, Fallon. And I, I yeah, do that's, a Zoom link, but it's not from the link. Not from the yeah, link. Oh. It's acting up today. I'm not sure why. No problem. Um, so Merva Pia is facilitating today, and she has asked us all to write on a piece of paper uh, or on a private document a question that we have for the community or for my fest, but not to share it. Don't share it. Just write it for yourself. Oh, that's so weird. Maybe there's something wrong with the link itself. Did other people use the link? Hmm. I sent so many different emails. There might be perhaps it's only the Egypt thing. Oh no, Irene. Well, Irene is in Africa too. I don't. Know. Anyway, let's. Uh, so you I'm need glad you're all here. Glad you're you all a, here. You need a question to the keep to it the, privately. Uh, Okay. To my uh, first community. Yeah, so a but question keep it that private. is, sorry, a, a question that is relevant for the context we have together. So my first and, and this session, uh, it doesn't have to be specifically about this question, but but should be relevant for the people, you know, joining a session like this one. And important for you to receive an answer. So that that's the only, that are the only rules. Thank you.
I'm going to repeat because one more person just came in. Mariam. Hi. How are you? So uh, Pia Hi. is facilitating the session and she's asked us to do something. So I'll ask her to repeat yes. that for you. Yes. So I have invited you all to write down a question, not in the chat, but uh, privately on a piece of paper or on a private document, a question that is uh, relevant for this context, for this community, and important for you to receive an answer to. But other than that, it can be about anything. And I think maybe to, would it be okay, Maha, do you think, to move on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I am very curious to find out uh, what question you actually did write down. But before we, we take that step, I would like to hear um, if some of you would share what it felt like coming up with a question before I had said very much. <laughs> I didn't tell you anything about questions or uh, anything about what I want to do uh, today with you guys. I just asked you to, to write down a question. Could some of you please say a few words about what happened inside of your head when you got that ta task? Well, at the beginning, this is my first meeting. So uh, it, it was hard. It's, it, it's kind of, I wanted to ask question, what, what is, the, it's, uh, uh, what is the, the main stream of this actually? However, I, I know that it's talking about AI and I'm interested in the AI, however, but uh, it was really difficult you know, to, to come up with a question. Yes, yeah, it, it, it can be difficult. Um, maybe uh, maybe some of, of your, uh, some of you have a few reflections on what the difficult part is about. You know, why is it difficult to come up with a question? So some people wrote in the chat, do you want me to help by reading? Or yeah, do you I, wanna... I, 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 yeah, 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 I, please sure. do. Uh, so Alia said she felt freedom and a big yeah. grin. Um, <laughs> Danielle is saying she's thinking how some questions are manipulative, like, don't you mm -hmm. agree? Mm -hmm. And Bonnie said it centered her, caused her to feel curious. I think initially for me to start off with the question, at first I was sort of stuck. And then once I got a question, all of a sudden I had like a dozen questions. And then I'm like, okay. So now do I have to choose one of these questions or is this, so it was that like that initial part of, okay, having to sort of figure out what is it that, you know, sort of anticipate, I guess, what this is going to be about the presentation mm -hmm. today, but also in the context of everyone else around. Yeah, exactly. So tuning in both on the session and on the people in the session, uh, what would be relevant? Is that also, Heather, uh, you, is that also part of what you were thinking, saying I worried about finding a question that is relevant for the community? Yes. I'm, I'm curious if uh, Bonnie and uh, Elia, uh, who said freedom, if, if you could uh, share a few words about what was going on. So for I me, found Oh, wait, go ahead, buddy. <laughs> oh, I just found that I, it's morning time for me here. And so I'm still waking up a bit and it just allowed me to be present and act. It felt like you were activating some things in my brain to go, oh, now you are here. Uh, it gave me a gift of being more present than I'm sometimes able to be because I'm usually in the future. So it's nice to be, to be present for a moment and, and just, just settle myself. Yeah, it was very... Oh, Very that's good. really nice. Thank you. And for me, it was the freedom because there weren't many restrictions, pretty much. I mean, none for me. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I can ask anything, really, as long as it's appropriate, of course, and relevant. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's how it felt, freedom. Amazing. Sierra, you, you said uh, it made you more introspective. Um, asking yourself and I think that's really really interesting to hear about because now we have both you know asking myself and and focusing on my own focus so to speak and we have focusing on the the community the other people um and then we also have the uh, the third thing you know what are we talking about what will be relevant for all of us to actually address 
that it's just to demonstrate. I really think when I say the power of questions, I think we don't have to do a lot of work to actually experience that power. <laughs> if we can activate both ourselves, our own focus and uh, our thinking about other people and thinking about what we share, uh, then it's actually pretty magical almost <laughs> uh, that that's possible just by inviting you to write down a question. Um, yes, mystery made me think what matters. I love that, Irene. Okay, now, um, would you, do you do this often when you kick off an, uh, a session with other people? Do you often ask them to start by writing down a question and do as Bonnie just said, you know, send to themselves and focus and feel now I'm here? How many of you have done it within the first seven minutes of a presentation or a session? Um, can I get Bonnie has done it? I can see. I usually ask a question. I don't know yes. if I ask them to ask that, questions, yeah. but that's not the same. No, it's not. It's definitely no. not the same. <laughs> Actually, I do it in, in one of my courses, Operation Research. I tell the students to ask themselves uh, sometimes the question mm -hmm. and answer it. So ask the question and answer it. Okay. And like give okay. them like uh, five minutes and then I tell them to mark their answers. Okay. It's, uh, <laughs> Um, and I, I I usually ask them to 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 uh, Yanni to think what type uh, what why are they there why are they in this class yeah so you ask a question as well yes so it's very different mm -hmm. like I, I'm asking them to ask a question yes so have any of you tried within the first five to seven minutes of a session with a group of people to invite them to write down a question like I just did. Heather, you not, have done not, not exactly like it. Is. No, but but it doesn't definitely sounds like you have been uh, playing around with the idea, Ahmed. And Heather, you were nodding as well. Yes, I teach um, English as a second or other language, mm -hmm. and so sometimes before getting them started in the conversation for beginners or lower level learners, yes. I'll say, "Hey, think of some questions to ask your partner about topic yes. mix." Yes, yes, nothing special. Mm -hmm. And then we have Virginia saying not to write down. Uh, what do you think about that aspect that I actually ask you to use your hands and write something down? Do you think that does something or do you think, you know, it could just be think of a question? Do you think that would be different if I you were not supposed? Mm -hmm. I think it allows them. I always do writing, mm -hmm. but I don't often do the questions for writing. Um, I teach taught communication so the writing allowed them always allows students time to think they don't necessarily have to to um write it down but they also don't get um uh they don't feel pressured from other other students throwing out questions mm. so they're able to they're given that quiet time to sort of come up with the questions Yes. But I usually don't do it in the very beginning. I usually um, will start and end with some sort of experience. Yes. And then I have them write the yes. question in response to that. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Uh, I, I wonder if, Yanni, in, in, in my, I teach uh, uh, journalism and mass communication. I, I wonder if it would differ because unfortunately, unfortunately, but it is a fact they they do not come with pencils, pens. But I in in my generation, and if if I'm writing something with my pen and pencil, paper and the old way, I think I it gives him more time to ponder, to think mm -hmm. of what I'm uh, I'm I'm producing. I wonder if this would be the same if I ask them to write something. Is it going to be different if I ask them? I insist on them writing with a paper and pen, or just to text on their mobiles. Mm. I, I really because I I don't know. I f I feel the difference. But I don't. I wonder if they in their generation, perhaps anybody yeah. that is younger in in uh, in age would would relate to that. I I, I really don't know. But uh, the problem with this approach to let them write down if it is with paper and pen, they don't have. I can see Heather always brings uh, paper and pen to make sure that that's not an excuse. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, that's nice. 
Okay, wonderful comments. Um, I really like Todd, you saying that uh, if you didn't write it down, the question would likely change the next time I tried to think of it. <laughs> and I think there's something, you know, in, in, the, in trying to say, well, I want to keep this question uh, and I want to look at it again, um, because I definitely think that you're right. It's changing all the time. Um, uh, what do we have? Maha, I hope you will help me as well if I miss something that we should address. Or make yes, it is saying questions always inspire other different branches of thought or follow ups. And uh, Irene is saying that if we write, what if we write questions and ask them later to respond as different people, mm -hmm. rather than as themselves could be mm -hmm. fun. Mm -hmm. And Virginia, many of her students prefer to write with pen and pencil over writing on the computer. My daughter is 11 and she does too. Mm. Okay, so I think now it's time uh, that I would like you to share your question in the chat. So just for us to get an uh, idea of whether you actually were focusing on the same things or uh, how uh, big diversity we're having uh, when giving each other tasks like this. So if you're up to it, please share it in the chat. Danielle says, do you feel confident about understanding and applying ethics in your role in education? So that's the ethical point of view. We always feel welcome to MyFest sessions. Why did you decide, decide to join MyFest? How much is too much information in a question? Wonderful. How do the question students ask LMS like ChatGPT affect their learning? How are you avoiding burnout and returning to joy in your teaching? Why are you here? How do we help people actually ask questions versus trying to make their point as they ask it, as in to truly help people become more curious? We will definitely get back to that one. How much is too much information in a question? Very meta. How can we expand the viewpoints in our conversations given institutional contexts that often try to narrow viewpoints? How do we practice self-care with my fest? What has been your greatest takeaway so far from my fest? How AI is going to affect our job? So it it, it seems like two main themes: uh, questions about my fest and questions about maybe three questions about uh, AI and questions about questions. Um, I think that will be um, and how to make the older generation see the vital need to accommodate that teaching pedag. Oh, I don't know how to pronounce that. Pedagogies, pedagogies yes. material to, to fit the age of uh, open. This is open, not pen. Open AI. Yes. Thank you. Hmm. Great. I We won't go into all these questions now. I just wanted to get a sense of, um, are you uh, focusing on the same things? And then we will definitely address some of them um, in the session. And, uh, and if you want us uh, to address some of them and, and we're not, then uh, of course, just uh, just speak up and, uh, and write in the chat. And I, I, Maha is helping me um, keep an eye on that. Um, Claudine, does the importance of AI in leveling the playing field in education, what is the most appropriate way to help students use it to develop their prompting skills? Oh, I have so, I would love to discuss this with you and I think we will. Um, I have prepared some slides, uh, uh, and the, and that's primarily focusing on um, the power of questions, on um, uh, how and especially why not uh, to use artificial intelligence when it comes to uh, helping ourselves and other people uh, practice um, the magic of questions and the art of, of asking questions. Um, and then I have uh, an, an exercise for us uh, where we will um, where we will ourselves ask more questions and help each other uh, also uh, come up with answers to our questions. So I think uh, I if it's okay with you, I will share a few uh, slides and uh, and I expect and and hope that you will all um, um, yeah speak up whenever there's something you want to ask or comment or take it in a different direction. So just to say that I didn't uh, make the slides for us to follow them very strictly, but just to make sure that I have something for inspiration. 
Uh, do you see my screen now? We're seeing your uh, editing Everything. side. Yeah. I'm do you want to? Yeah, it's just unshare and reshare. Okay. Once you do, because uh, it's only sharing one window and the slideshow goes on another window. That's You need to do the slide share on your side, the slideshow, and then share the screen. Ah, oh, okay. That's all. Sorry. That's all. Yeah. Just the order of things. Hmm. I think you could also have uh, done the screen, the slideshow from where you are, if you can't find it. Um, yeah, good. perfect. Yes, oh, that's perfect. what you want. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so happy this is working. Okay. So how to ask a question for number one skill, we all need to navigate the EIH. That was a, the... the the topic uh, for this session. So what I would like for us to, to have a conversation about is what we know, focusing on answers, what we want to know, focusing on questions and how to navigate the gap. Um, and I will get back to uh, how we can um, can do that together. And uh, and then the, it just says Q&A, but I, I think and hope that we will have a lot of Q&As uh, <laughs> uh, um, throughout the whole session. Um, and um, I know that typically we will probably, you know, focus on questions uh, and, and then go to the answers. But I, I think that's um, maybe that's part of um, of the some of the problems we have when dealing with questions that that we think we can start with with the questions. But typically we already have a lot of answers and a lot of ideas and a lot of um you know expectations uh, so we might as well just uh, start with that and uh, and then uh, look at the questions so let me just to uh, give you a taste of the two uh, the first of the two the what we know and what we want to know uh, i brought uh, a few quotes actually i brought a lot of quotes because uh, i like to invite you know some of uh, history's greatest thinkers into the conversation so uh, most of my slides are quotes of people that I really think we should learn from. Um, and, and then we just, you know, use them for that. And then we can have the conversation based on, on what we learned uh, from these uh, very wise people. And two of them, um, I, I, I'm not sure whether you know, you probably know Alan Turing. Uh, yeah, probably being educators, you also know Gadama. <laughs> um, but, but let's see, I found these uh, quotes. The first one is, the question and answer method seems to be suitable for introducing almost any one of the fields of human endeavor that we wish to include. So that's uh, Tuang saying this in 1950. And then we have uh, Gadama uh, 10 years later saying there's no such thing as a method uh, of learning to ask questions, of learning to see what is questionable. On the contrary, the important thing is the knowledge that one does not know. So we have on the one hand, on the answer hand, so to speak, um, we have this perspective that we have a method, a question and answer method that is very useful when we want to build digital computers or learn new things or do science or whatever. Uh, and then on the other hand, on the question side, uh, what we are getting is uh, Gadamer saying, well, that's very nice, but there is no method. <laughs> there is no such a thing. So how do how do we deal with that? And I will uh, start with the left one with the with the toying uh, and the question and answer method. That's the uh, the thing I would like to start with. Um, Maha, you're keeping an eye on the chat, right? And and, and people uh, will please uh, chip yes. in. So the first quote I brought here from from Tuing, or the second one. As, and this is uh, this is the very 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 beginning. This is the first sentences of the um, of the article where he introduces what we now know as the Turing test. Uh, it was uh, called the imitation game uh, in the article, but this is the very first part of his um, of his article. 
He said, I propose to consider the question, can machines think? This should begin with definitions of the meaning of the terms machine and think. Instead of attempting such a definition, so, and, and this is what he says first, then he says something else about mm, defining and it's a bit hard to define because how would we do that and doesn't make sense. And then he just says, instead of attempting such a definition, I shall replace the question by another which is closely related to it and is expressed in relatively unambiguous words. The new form of the problem can be described in terms of a game, which we call the imitation game. So what is happening here in the beginning of the article is that he's asking a really, really interesting question, which is, can machines think? But instead of exploring, what does it mean to think? Why do human beings think? Um, what would it take for a machine to think? He introduces the imitation game. So, so he leaves this very, very interesting question behind and moves on and, and saying, let's do an experiment. Let's see what would it actually take for us to be able to say, well, now the machine is capable of doing something that we could call thinking. So, so this shift, I think, is extremely important, you know, shift in, in, in how he chooses to address uh, what it means to think and, and, uh, and, and how to, to uh, create the foundation for what we now know as artificial intelligence. And you probably already know, but the Turing test he describes or the imitation game he describes can be, uh, is like this, that uh, he says that if a digital computer has passed the Turing test. Um, that happens when a remote interrogator cannot distinguish between the computer and a human being. And that's based on the answers they provide to the interrogator's questions. So we have one person asking questions of two different, um, what, what does he call it, two uh, respondents. Um, and if the responses that come back, if the answers that come back if the person asking the question is in doubt whether this is a machine or a human being, then Turing says we would we would uh, we would have proved that the machine is uh, thinking, or then we would have built this digital computer that imitates the human brain uh, in a way that is um, that is to his satisfaction. So, so what I would ex excuse me, I have a dog who really wants to join me. Just give me a second. Your dog is welcome. <laughs> your dog's welcome. We want to see your dog. <laughs> yes. Oh, no, no, she's happy. You want to see her? Yeah. Please. Oh, she's tiny. <laughs> she's not tiny, tiny, but I thought she was uh, a bigger dog. <laughs> no. <laughs> she thinks she's very big. Yeah, um, everyone is not. welcome here. Yeah. Kids, dogs, <laughs> That's whatever. nice. So Virginia was asking a question, but I'm yeah, not sure perfect. when she was asking it. Um, she was asking, doesn't it depend on who's asking and answering and where they are in the power structure? I think that was related to the, the slide with Turing and Gadamer together. Yeah, so even, even with Turing, like this is part of, you know, who's, who's deciding who gets to ask the first question? <laughs> Because I'm thinking back to what we just did in terms of um, so many of us will begin as teachers asking a question to find out what students know. Mm -hmm. Does that makes sense. But it's very rare that we have students start off by asking what we know. Yes. So. So what I'm, I'm, I think I'm trying to do right now is to try and figure out, you know, how, uh, given the different um, ways of approaching the idea of questions and questions and answers, how it, it kind of paves the way for very, very different ways of dealing with situations where people do or do not ask questions. So are we, you know, are we um, cultivating an environment? But it can be, you know, in class, but it can also be in an organization or the whole, you know, the whole school. It can be, you know, in, in the family, it can be wherever. Are we cultivating an environment where we focus on the questions people are asking or whether we are focusing on the answers people are providing? Um, and the we is kind of the, 
you know, the power, uh, the power in the in, in this situation, that could be the teacher, that could be the parent, that could be the leader, you know, the one holding the most power in the context. Uh, do they focus on other people's questions or do they focus on other people's answers? And, and what's, I, what I think is interesting about, you know, bringing in Turing, uh, going back, because now everybody's talking about AI. Everybody's talking about ChatGPT. Everybody's talking about how to use these uh, language models uh, for all kinds of things. So what I thought was interesting is to take a step back and say, how did the, all this start? You know, what is the... Uh, and we're talking about how to do ethical uh, technology and how to uh, include uh, humans and, 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 and build, you know, tech for humanity and human uh, centered and human focused technology. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, what is the basic understanding of human beings that were brought into artificial intelligence from the beginning? You know, how did Turing and, and guys like him how did they understand what it means to be human? And reading this article made me realize that it's pretty obvious that what uh, Turing is doing is that he's saying the most important thing in the human brain, uh, and when we talk about thinking and talking about intelligence, it's the ability to answer questions. So that's why he built this machine to and trained it, you know, and, and, and designed it to be able to answer questions answer questions in a way that could be confused with how a human being answer questions. So instead of, he says that he, it's a question answer method, but all he's doing in terms of the machine is focusing on its ability to provide answers. So that's, you know, the kind of the human, the way of understanding humans as our strongest ability as humans is our ability to ask uh, to answer questions. So if the machine can do that, it would be able to imitate us. It would be able to take over uh, different tasks that only human beings have been able to do up until now. But what he is completely leaving behind is the focus on the ability to ask questions, you know, the human ability to ask questions. So, and, and, and we saw that, you know, in the initial quote, the question and answer method seems to be suitable for introducing almost any one of the fields of human endeavor that we wish to include. But what has happened since the 1950s is that we see an extremely decrease in the cultivation of curiosity, critical thinking, and creativity, which is the human's ability to ask valuable questions, and an extremely increase powered by so many billions of dollars that no one can imagine to invest in artificial intelligence and that is digital computers ability to provide plausible answers. So that's actually what has happened, uh, you know, since uh, Turing wrote this article. So Pia, Pia, are you mm -hmm. getting at, I mean, I think that's what you're getting at, but I'm just gonna ask anyway. <laughs> you're saying, but we, but we would still not be able to use the AI's answers if we didn't ask good questions, if we didn't have humans asking good questions in the first place. Yeah, but also what I'm, um, also what I'm, I'm, I think I'm exploring here, and I'm curious to hear what you think about how you think about it is um, when the most powerful because before I talk about, you know, the teacher and parent and the leader being powerful, but looking back on history, the powerful people have been within science, you know, within the past 400 years or something like that, the power has been with science. It has not been, at least not in the uh, Western European uh, part of the world that I'm from, it has not been on religion, it has not been on uh, art uh, or culture, it has been on science. And the science has progressed, you know, enormously and technology has been built based on science and not based on uh, how art is understanding humans or how uh, religious people are understanding humans or how the nature, you know, that's not science nature, but nature as all other kinds of uh, nature has not been feeding into our understanding of human beings. It has only been science and technology and how that uh, focus from the powerful and power is also money, right? From the power has 
made us made it very difficult for us to even remember the power of questions remember the magic of questions so even now when we now we talk about being good at making prompts making good prompts we're not talking about asking good questions or asking you know cultivating our ability to be curious we're talking about how do we make a good prompt to make the uh, so we at we kind of we try to adapt our questions to the technology. How do we become good at asking questions that will make the technology even better, that will make technology provide answers that are even better for us? So we are still not looking at the questions, would be a, a claim. I don't, I would love to hear how you think about that. All of you. <laughs> well, I, I come from communication and um, one of the things that we always talk about in communication is we look at the listening and we talk about the um, the reading and not just the prompts. And so really this is um, when, when uh, I teach my communication courses with technology, um, that's one of the frustrations is students, for example, may not, they're looking for information, they can't find it. And is that because of them or is that the technology that doesn't serve the purpose? Because what they're looking for, I can go into a library, for example, I can pull out a book, thumb through the index, so can my students, and they can find the information in a book quickly. They can do the same thing just Googling, but they may not be able to find the pieces of information, the broad amount of, of information that this skill of them being able to sift through the information that's relevant for them in particular mm. to answer the questions that they want. And it's very frustrating because what it'll be is always the same answer. Mm -hmm. and that's yeah. not the answer they're looking for. No. And, and, and is, I think I want to ask this as a question, but I think it will come out as a question, including a suggestion, <laughs> just to warn you. And do you, do you think that is also because I would, I would think it's one thing is that they don't get the answer they are looking for. Another thing is that they are not being trained in staying in the room where it's okay to have the questions, you know, to let the questions guide you, where it's not, the questions are not necessarily, they are not only valuable when they uh, deliver an answer, they are also valuable by, you know, having you think and having you explore and having you talk to your peers and having you talk to your teacher and Yeah, there's a couple of things in the chat. One, Perfect. I think sort of addresses what you're saying, I think. Bonnie's saying that so much of the focus is on the transactional in terms of asking and answering versus the transformational, which is going beyond our current imaginative capacities. Mm. Um, and Danielle Dubian is also saying that to write good questions, it takes a lot of work to develop strong vocabulary. This is something that she's saying she still has to work at, obviously younger. People. Yes. Although they ask why a lot, which is an yeah, question. I would like Danielle. Could you please say a little bit about that? Because I think you know the kids I know they know how to ask questions pretty young. Uh, for a long time, uh, communication has been a challenge for me, and in fact, it seems that uh, the ability to write and speak effectively. Um, people who don't have that seem to tend to go into the sciences. And, and that was actually one of my reasons. And then later I went into education and then uh, continued studying in education. And so in that field, that's where I developed uh, my communication skills a lot. And so even, at, even though I was an adult, I had a lot of difficulty writing and asking uh, things meaningfully. And now that I've gone through all this education in the field of education, I think a lot harder about what I say and what I ask. Uh, so yeah, I find that, um, yeah, for me, it's it's been, um, there's been a lot of development, I would say in the last five years in how I communicate. So, and and I've, I've come to value, um, 
the right vocabulary and I, I hesitate to say accurate vocabulary right vocabulary because we all have our own different words and what they mean to us but um yeah i i think a lot more about the words that i use in any format questions or statements or whatever and you think students need to do that because they feel uncomfortable asking questions if they don't uh you know the thing is i never i didn't feel uncomfortable about asking or communicating uh, before because i well to an extent I did, but I didn't realize how poor my communication skills were. Now that I do realize, this is why I continue to work at it. I can't speak for how students feel about asking questions. What I do think is that, um, and you know, it, it, I think it may be worth supporting metacognition uh, so that students think about the questions that they ask. You know, sometimes it's just very simple. It's a uh, Sometimes the questions are very easy and yeah, they're very straightforward. Like, why is the sky blue? A very valid question. And it leads to a very interesting scientific answer and exploration. Um, but there are times when I think uh, it, asking a question can be a lot more difficult and students may or may not um, understand how to ask the questions that they need to ask uh, to get the answer that they're truly seeking. And also, um, I my tendency when I was a teacher was to encourage the students to find the answers on their own rather than relying on questions of their colleagues and, and teachers too much. So yeah, I think it's a matter of uh, learning how to ask the questions that you intend that you really that really reflect what you're curious about and knowing when to ask the questions so that you don't use them as a crutch too much, but also that you not hesitate to ask questions. So there's a balance there to be struck, I think, in how questions are used. So Maha had asked me, um, I had put in here that um, in, in communication, um, when we talk about uh, discourse, it's negotiating understanding. And the difficulty with technology is you can't negotiate understanding with a machine that's been pre-programmed or with a prompt. Mm. So you don't get that sense of negotiation, even if you know how to ask a question or you know how to answer it, because you aren't necessarily asking the correct questions or the correct answers for what you want to know. So there's sort of that disconnect um, between what you want to know. You know that there's information out there. You just don't know how to ask it, the machine in a way. Whereas when I'm in a conversation, if I ask a question and someone answers back to me that it's not correct, I can say, well, okay, I understand where you're going with this, but that wasn't what I meant. So I can reform the question because what I'm doing is looking, anticipating where that other person, where they're going and what their thinking was. So you're answering this based on this, but really I'm asking this question. So I'm gonna reformulate it. So it's a lot of reformulation and negotiating between two people that I don't see that you can do necessarily with AI. And this is not also, this is actually my dissertation was on group work. And I looked at um, these types of conversations in, um, in, in a business setting. And there is that sense of negotiation at all levels. Yes, it makes a lot of sense. Thanks. I think um, I think I would like to to um, to take it. Maybe I, I'm not sure whether it fits what what you were all just saying. But let me take a, a few more steps and see uh, whether it makes sense uh, in this. Because um, what I was curious about when what what I am curious about, you know, th uh, thinking about AI and and how it impacts everything right now is. 
So if we know that that chewing um, at the outset had an understanding of the of human beings as as you know our very uh, um, our biggest ability or feature is our ability to provide answers. Um, and, and we can see that now built in in, in, a, in a lot of structures in society uh, at large. Then I was trying to ask myself, what would have happened if Turing had stayed with his initial questions, asking, can machines think? You know, that was his initial question. What would have happened if instead of just leaving that behind, because he thought, well, that's not a good answer to that. So I don't want to pay attention to this question. Um, what if he did pay attention? And what if he did what another really brilliant guy uh, used to do, apparently, uh, namely Einstein, uh, who said, uh, or is supposed to have said, that if he had an hour to solve a problem and his life depended on the solution, he would spend the first 55 minutes determining the proper question to ask. But once I know the proper question, I could solve the problem in less than five minutes. I've, I really enjoy this quote because I think it's spot on in terms of also what, what I think some of you are talking about, that when we talk about questions, we tend to always talk about answers instead. So do, they, do we ask questions that actually provide the answer we want? Do we ask good questions, meaning that would give us good answers? Um, how fast can we get from the from the question to the answer? Do we have to search a lot or do we have to have a lot of conversations? And I think what Einstein is saying is, well, do spend as much time as possible on the questions and don't rush. Don't rush to the answer, because if we rush to the answer, there's a big risk that we will be solving the wrong problem. So even if we do get the answer that we wanted to get, there's a risk that we were asking from a narrow place, that, that the question we were asking was not our real question, it was just our initial question. And now that we, we got an answer, we can, you know, uh, we, we, we are moved in a direction that if we didn't get an answer, if we were just, you know, um, some of, one of you said in the beginning, I had to come up with an answer and then suddenly I had a lot of answers. I don't know if it was you, Virginia, um, but suddenly I had a lot of answers and I had to pick. I had to choose what question do I want to ask. Um, and that's kind of, as I understand Einstein, that's what you should go for. You should go for asking, you know, 20 questions before you ask your, this is the question I want to explore further. And even then be prepared that it can change, that now it's a new question, now it's a new question. And what I'm interested in, how do we help students? How do we help the next generation uh, exercise this muscle, this curiosity, creativity, critical thinking muscle that comes with question asking? How do we help them stay in the question instead of rushing to the answer? Because every, at, at least that's all the science uh, scientists I know, all, they all know that it's the questions, it's the ignorance, you know, it's the, uh, there's even a scientist who wrote a book called uh, Ignorance about uh, all the questions that we should give more attention when we teach rather than the answers, because the, it's the questions and the curiosity and the creativity that is driving science forward. And, and that's also what I, I think we can see here that, that, uh, that Einstein is saying. So if Turing had been like Einstein, he would probably have asked questions like, why do humans think? Um, when do humans think? When do they fail to think? Who benefits from human thinking? Who benefits from humans not thinking? The tech industry. Um, what happens when humans don't think? How does it affect human beings to think? How does it affect them not to think? How will technology that mimics the human ability to provide answers affect the questions humans ask and don't ask? So what I'm afraid of here with, with all this AI fascination uh, is that we simply forget to ask some of the questions that no chatbot will ever be able to answer. That's the existential, the ethical, the epistemological questions that has to do with human beings being human. 
Um, and, and these are some of the questions that if Turing had asked some of these questions, we don't know what would have happened, but at least it would have forced them to consider some of the things and some of the consequences that, that we now have to deal with, because nobody seemed to deal with them within the power of, uh, of technology. So that was, that was what I brought about, you know, what we what we know, the focus on the answers. Um, and now I would like to, to go through uh, the next section, uh, what we want to know about the questions. And I don't see any comments. So if it's okay with you, I will, I cannot see any of you. Um, you were just so commenting that you're only citing men here. Sorry? I was just commenting that I'm not hearing any female scientists or philosophers and what they think about questions. Um, so. I haven't found uh, any, I think I'm the, the best there is, Maha. <laughs> <laughs> Danielle found someone though, um, Suzanne Langer. We'll find out what she says later. Okay, let, let me go. No. Um, let me go through this because what I was, uh, what I, I think would be interesting is um, to find out, you know, um, what is it about these questions that help us, as Einstein said, help us solve problems that we would otherwise not be able to solve? What is it about these questions? And how do we learn to use questions to solve problems? You know, so Einstein say we can do that, but how do we learn? Um, and and how, do we, uh, how do we learn to deal with these existential and ethical questions that come with AI? Because we need to learn and we need to learn fast, apparently, <laughs> because uh, otherwise we, we will not be able to, 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 to move forward. So this is the best description that I have found of what it means to be human. It's the best description I've ever seen. Uh, it's the one that I really treasure the most. And I think it's a very, very good alternative to what I found in, in Turing. It's uh, Nietzsche, um, who said, der Mensch ist das noch nicht festgestellte Tier, meaning that the human being is the yet undefined animal. That is, that it's the animal that has not been put in position yet. So it's still, you know, it has to find its own position. We have to come up with our own um, answers. So to take this position, uh, to find out uh, where we should, uh, what we should think and how we should be in the world, uh, we ask questions. That's what we do. Um, so we ask, who am I? Why am I here? What should I do? How do I find out? Where should I go? And with whom? These are some of these you know, questions that every human being across the globe are asking themselves at some point, several points during life, because that's the only way for us to check some of these boxes to find out, you know, uh, what, 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 what is my job here? Um, and, and Nietzsche says that, you know, that is what it means to be human, to, to, uh, to take our own position. And you can also hear it in the wording, you know, to take a position and to pose a question. It kind of, it's, it's the same, the same as giving a response and taking responsibility. There's something going on here that is extremely basic in what it means to be human. So because nobody can answer these questions for us, there aren't, you know, none of us can, not a machine, not another human being, not our parents, you know, no one can answer these questions for us. We have to ask them ourselves. Um, and that's pretty hard work. Um, and the tricky thing, and I, I must admit, I sometimes uh, think that maybe Turing knew this and that's why he left the question behind. Uh, because the tricky thing, as we already uh, saw uh, in the initial quote from Gadama is that this is not Gadama, this is something else, but the act of questioning cannot be taught. And, uh, and Strauss says here, uh, following up, nor does it require a teacher. And of course, I really, really enjoy this quote, especially talking to educators, because I think this, is, this must be extremely difficult. So we know that the ability to ask questions, uh, to be curious, to practice critical thinking, to be creative, it all has to do with asking questions. And now we're getting closer and closer to realizing that it cannot be taught to ask questions and no teacher can teach us to ask questions. And now what Strauss is saying is that it doesn't even require a teacher. But what does that mean? Um, and how does that actually impact 
uh, the question we were talking about, you know, how to learn, how to learn to use questions to solve problems. And now we're back to Gadamer. Because he said there's no such thing as a method of learning to ask questions, of learning to see what is questionable or problematic. Uh, on the contrary, the example of Socrates teaches that the important thing is the knowledge that one does not know. So we are back to the ignorance part and the part of actually making room for this ignorance. Um, and I think that what this means is that not only can we forget about everything that has to do with leaving it to AI to teach our kids how to ask questions. And a recent study actually suggested that, that maybe we could, uh, we could use AI to uh, help um, train the, the kids um, and the children's uh, curious and question asking skills. But, but according to Gadamer, that would be a really bad idea. So not only we cannot use uh, AI to become better at asking questions, we can actually not use uh, science either. Um, even one of the uh, founders of the scientific method, Descartes, um, said that he also depended on something else. Even Descartes knew um, that, um, uh, that there's something beyond the scientific method. There's, there's something, uh, the scientific method uh, requires something else that is not scientific. Uh, for Descartes, it was God. Um, and that probably uh, made a lot of sense and still make a lot of sense for a lot of people. But there's also a lot of people for whom it does make sense to, to say, well, especially scientists actually saying, well, we cannot have God in the equation. But, but, but even the founders of the scientific method were saying, well, there's something beyond that we need in order to even do science. We need curiosity and stuff like that to, to, uh, to build science, but it's not science itself and it cannot be taught like a science. Okay. Do I need to address some of your questions? Mm, not necessarily. I will move on. Irene is saying, which century was this? These philosophers, men thought that we could not learn to ask questions. They had not met many women, it seems. <laughs> no, but that doesn't, I, I don't think that has to do with uh, whether you believe or don't believe that, that, you, can be, that you can be taught to ask questions. Um, but uh, Descartes, that's uh, way back, you know, from the 15th uh, century. So that's way back in the beginning of the industry, um, uh, the scientific method and the um, what's it called industrial revolution. So that's way back in the beginning. Uh, Gadamer uh, died in two thousand and two. Um, so Danielle, yes, I have to wonder why they are so close to teaching people how to. Yeah. Okay. So that's great. This is the answer. So the act of questioning cannot be taught, nor does it require a teacher. We already saw that. The first question, and now it's the, now it's the reason for that. The first question arises early in the life of every healthy child from the very roots of its existence. We are able to ask single questions because we're questioning beings at our very core. So that's the answer. It cannot be taught and it does not require a teacher because everybody already knows how to do it. That's that 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 that's it, <laughs> and that's also why I was not afraid of uh, kicking off the session by saying, "Please write down a question." I didn't have to explain to you how to do it. I know you're very skilled educators, all of you, but I do that when I teach second graders as well. People know how to ask questions, and they do that from almost the minute they learn how to uh, to speak. They also know how to express how to ask questions. So, so that is the reason. The reason is that we already know how to do that. Um, and now something else is going on in the chat. But we are enculturated not to ask questions. Exactly. Um, and Sierra said, uh, perhaps creativity is missing from the scientific method on the contrary. Yeah, so um, there's, I have no, 
What is important for me to uh, emphasize is no science, scientist I know at least and have read about would deny that creativity and curiosity is at the heart, at the center of science. But they cannot treat these things scientifically. You cannot, uh, you cannot, mm, the second you try to teach someone to ask questions, you're preventing them from, uh, from using the innate uh, ability to be curious. Curiosity is something that comes from within. It's not something that comes, you know, that's put on you. It's extremely difficult to make other, uh, to teach other people how to be curious. You can inspire them. You can, you know, motivate them in different ways. You can build environment and cultivate, you know, learning uh, environments where people are curious together. But it's extremely hard to say do A, B, C, and D, and then people will be curious. I think that's a way of talking about it. Does that make sense? Yes. And I think also, though, that what happens, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but the way that our education system is, and depending on what methodology you use for, for education, it becomes, if, if you are, for example, the scientific method, there are many ways to teach science, but there is only one that's approved by the scientific community. Um, that's beginning to change a little bit. But the thing is, if, if you are not taught to be curious, if, if by you being curious means that you're not going to do well, um, in life, you're going to be assessed at a lower, you know, a lower grade, then you're not, you, you learn not to ask questions. Yes. So it's not really the same as what you're saying. You're saying you can't teach curiosity. And I agree with that, but you can teach someone to stop being curious. Yes. Because yes. if they're curious, then yes. that's going that's to be to their it. detriment. Yes. But that's a really, really good way of putting it. I'm really, I really appreciate that. Uh, and that's why I think we should, because I could, uh, I should probably have asked for more time now, because now I have to choose between uh, going deeper into why is it and what is it we should focus on in order to, to cultivate curiosity and actually practicing it. Uh, so I have to we could always offer another session and ask people who are in the room to vote for which one of these two things they want to do. What do you yes. think? Yeah, so, so ask them a question. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I really enjoyed what you just said, Virginia. Uh, and uh, and I could now I, I could I could also go very, very quickly through, you know, the uh, this I have about, you know, why, what is it that we should pay attention to, in order to make sure that curiosity doesn't go away. Um, because it is a big risk at that I can see that with my own kids in school. So let me just go through very quickly, and then I think we should should uh, practice. <laughs> uh, I would want to introduce a tool uh, that that's kind of my answer to this problem. Um, so, what is the big difference between us and AI is that we have a body, um, and and the philosophers have tried to uh, to neglect neglect that and say, well, that's not important. But uh, in the from the eighties, nineteen eighties, and and forward, maybe all, already from the sixties. Uh, people have been focusing within philosophy as well on what does it actually mean to have a body. It's very basically, it means taking up a space. It means being bound by time. It means having a sense of self and having a sense of others. And these basic, basic things, it's just, you know, that just comes with having a body. It's beautiful that we, that we have this because having a body means that we have a unique position, a unique perspective. Uh, being in a unique position in the world means that you see something that other people cannot see because they're not in the same position. It also means that we have a sense of distance. You know, I can see that something is behind something else because I know that I have a back and I know that I have a front and I can, you know, it, it gives us a room of uh, a sense of space and of a uh, room. Um, we can also see uh, by using a body that we are similar to things. This is Merleau Ponty, a French philosopher saying, like, you know, the things that we want to acknowledge and we want to recognize and understand, they are also in the world. They have a body as well. So we are like the things that we are trying to understand, whereas artificial intelligence 
it's not like the things that it's trying to explain or it's trying to uh, collecting data uh, about. It's something completely different. So that's also a, a very strong um, feature of having a body. We can feel connected with things. We know that there's something we don't know. We know there's a knowledge gap. That's why we ask questions. Um, and we have this uh, sense of, of depth. The second one, you know, having a body means being bound by time. That means that we are aging, that we are going to die at some point. Um, that means that we constantly need to learn because it's not like if we know something, it will stay in our head forever. No, we have to repeat what we learn. We have to build on what we learn. So we are timely uh, creatures. Um, and, and that means that we have to uh, repeat and we have to... Uh, to, to recognize a, a new and built and built and built. And that's back into the unique position because we have different experiences and we learn different things. Then we have unique uh, input for the world uh, and perspectives. And then uh, having a sense of self. I think this is really beautiful that we have a sense of being the same over time. So we have this idea that Although, or this sense that although we are getting older, we are still the same. I'm still me. I have been me for 46 years now, and I will be hopefully for a lot of years more, although I'm changing. So that's a really complex realization that we already have within us. And we can touch something and be touched at the same time. So, so that is, uh, again, extremely complex and something that is uh, unique for, for human um, beings and something that we should use when we think about uh, how to uh, stay uh, curious and how to help children and students stay curious. That is to use all these things that comes for free. We don't have to teach them. They already have all these powers. Um, so how do we unleash that? And having a sense of others, it kind of comes with, you know, having a sense of same means I also have an idea that's something that's not me, something that's different. Um, and I also know that there's a difference between me, you and it. So that's also extremely um, powerful and a sense of similarities and differences between things. And that sums up to what I call the magical question triangle, that when we ask questions, we automatically activate we were talking about this in the beginning as well. We activate our ability to consider our own position. You know, I have, I am someone who now wants to ask about this. So I'm a same, I have my position in the world. I activate my perspective. We connect with each other. So we, we realize, okay, this is a community of educators. What would be relevant? Who would I like, you know, to, to have a conversation with here? So that's, you know, this, this sense of being some, someone among uh, many. And we commit to a shared purpose. So we use, you know, our experience to know that we can agree or we can disagree. We can know and not know. And maybe you know something that I don't. So this magical question triangle is activated. And the beautiful thing is that, that if we do it simultaneously, if we have multiple question and answering um, going on, we unleash the wisdom of the crowd and we make it easier for people to help each other develop together and reach these goals together that Einstein was talking about. Einstein was focused on his own questioning, but what we're doing is we're try trying to take it a step further and say, we need to democratize the power of questions. And when we do that, we actually unleash this very powerful um, group dynamics as well. Okay, that was the quickest as I could do. Um, let me show you uh, what I and a few colleagues came up with when we said we need to build tech that supports this. We have so much technology that is working against this human nature of being curious and created together. Technology almost by design for the past many, 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 many years has prevented us from being curious, saying it wanted everything to be easy. We just want to help you guys. You know, you can easily find the answers. You can easily come from A to B. You can easily do this and this and that. Realizing that being human is not about doing easy. It's about putting in the work, the work, you know, asking the tough questions, finding a way to deal with these questions, even though they cannot be answered easily. And what we came up with is what we call question jam. It's a free digital tool 
we are a non-profit uh, association so uh, it's the, there are no money uh, involved no investors not anything there never will be and uh, that's why we founded as a non-profit uh, organization um, and what we wanted to do is build a tool that supports everything uh, we've been talking about. And I think we should just try it out. We can do that. I won't have much time following up on it, but I think you should try it. Um, it's uh, extremely uh, simple. Um, maybe I will stop sharing here. And while I find the other screen, uh, feel free to let me know if you have any comments or questions right now. Can you see, what can you see? You can see question jam. You can. Uh, yes. Mm. Oh, that's perfect because I cannot. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> uh, you need to click create jam, right? I need to stop. So what do you see? Do you see uh, the, the actual login interface? Okay. No, we see the question and you needed to click create jam to run it. Okay, that's interesting. A question about students and AI. Student, student engagement and learning in the AI age. That's what you see? Yes. And yeah. Click, and click okay. create. Uh, and join. Okay. So uh, let me tell you, you probably know uh, Kahoot, how to uh, sign up, you know, using a QR, a QR code or uh, an, a PIN. Uh, the sign up process is the same. But what's different is that for seven minutes, we will be exchanging questions and answers with each other. Everybody gets to ask uh, questions, and every time you ask a question, you choose one of uh, the other participants whom you, uh, from whom you want an answer. If the person is busy, it's grayed out. You have to choose another one. We do that in silence for seven minutes. Uh, are you going to provide us with the link? Uh, can you use? Can you see now the QR code and? Um... You're not no. sharing your screen now. No, no, sorry. <sighs> So you're not just sure. not sharing your screen at all. That's you might way. have too many windows open. Eh? You just unshared. So you just need to share again. Yeah, so now we have the QR code. If you have a phone or if you don't have, uh, if you want to use a browser, it's one SHFGF. So this one, the, the tricky thing with Question Jam is we all have to join or if, you, you know, once it starts, you can't join, so. So Maha is a super user. Uh, she was one <laughs> of the first to, uh, to, to use this uh, beta uh, product. Um, so you can uh, count on her to know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's right, uh, you have to sign up now. And uh, if something goes wrong or you are, you, 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 uh, if you lose your internet or something like that, then you cannot come back in. So, um, so there's 16 of us and you, so we'll know. Who else is able to join? I think quite a few people now have used it with us, so I okay, think it's getting okay. easier. Uh, QR is easier. Irene is yeah. learning that. Yeah. Tells me, I, yeah, you're in. The jam will begin soon. Please. Wait. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Um, and you know this, Pia. That I think yes, it isn't able to join Question Jam. Mm -hmm. I think, but I'm not really sure. Yes, sir. Do you want to try and see if it works? Is he gone? I think he might have left. So I'm not sure how many people are supposed to be in here, but now we have 13. Is there mm -hmm. someone who's 14, someone who is not in yet, who needs help? Or... Yeah, does anybody... It's not alphabetical. Is it alphabetical? Um, okay. It is. It is. Your yes. your tool is alphabetical, yeah. So, so Mahmoud so and I Maryam. Just scroll down to see. see. Yeah. If, so yes, it is listening only. Should we should we go? Okay. okay does we, anybody else want us to wait for them? I think yeah. Just in the interest of time, we're yeah. almost. Like there are only two people or something who didn't join. Okay. Yes, it is one of them. So okay. yeah, let's go. Okay, so I will start. We will jam for seven minutes. It's a hard stop. Um, mm -hmm. I will give you a warning, um, but uh, please, uh, and there are no stupid questions or wrong answers. We're just jamming for fun uh, about this topic. So just, uh, 
Have fun. So I'm asked to enter my email. Is it okay? You shouldn't be asked to enter your no. email. No, enter your email sorry. to receive a copy of the data. Have you been using Question Jam before? No, that's the first time. Okay, that's weird. It's it asked too me early. If I wanted to sign up for a newsletter. Is that what you're seeing? Just click out of the signing up for a newsletter option. You you should just uh, be in a in a in a space where you can ask and answer questions. So if that's not the case, I'm very sorry. Then there is some kind of bug that you will need to share with me. I have not tried that before. It's strange because she's in. I'm not really sure what happened there. Can I log out and then log in again? Oh, what's no, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm not really sure what happened there. Now I'm confused what we are trying to do now. Okay, so are you in question, Jem? You should ask questions. As soon as you ask a question, it's going to ask you to choose someone to receive that question from you. And you just but, keep asking questions to other people in the room, and they will ask you questions. But how and then you'll be asked to answer them. And how to log in. Oh, so you weren't... Uh, Pia, can you check the list of people? Maybe you didn't... Yeah, what should I click to log in? It's, yeah, it's, it's too, too late. late. We tried to call on everybody when we, we were missing like a couple of people, but you didn't answer, so we didn't know if you were there or not. So as soon as it starts, you can't log in afterwards. You know what I mean? No problem. Yeah, oh, we, we, we'll have other opportunities to try it. So, no. And is it possible to send us the link so that we can maybe try it on our own later? Yeah, so it's questionjam.it. Okay. Or dot .com, actually. But okay. you, you need to have several people there to be able to try it. So we can oh, try it again in some of the yeah, sure. my first session. Yeah, thank you. Sometimes when I'm facilitating Pia, so I didn't tell you this, but I open an incognito window and use it myself mm -hmm. so that people who weren't able to join are at least watching what it looks like. So that's yeah. why the dem demo Yeah, apps. okay. Well, that's nice. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea.
Uh, so the aim behind that is mainly to let the students ask questions and think critically or um, I will uh, I, I will answer that just in a few minutes just to oh, make sure yes. that people have that's a it's a great question thank you thank you So now it's 30 seconds left. So if you're in the middle of writing an answer or a question, try to see if you can finish it, finalize it. So Nasin and Ahmed, don't worry, we'll have a chance. If you want, we can just do a session with three of us later. Yeah, that would be great. No <laughs> because it seems that it's a, it's a really good tool. So I'm, I'm sorry that you were, were having problems. Um, okay. So so uh, feel free, the one, those of you who were actually uh, able to, to jam, I would love if you would write, you know, your um, how you experienced it and, and, and your you know, what you think about it uh, in the chat and, and please be very uh, honest. Uh, we, we want all the feedback that we can get, but, but the idea is to do something that you are not typically doing, you know, when, when you're teaching or when you are facilitating stuff, the difficult part can be to facilitate conversations uh, peer to peer uh, and to make sure that people are learning together and also to, um, to unleash their uh, curiosity, making room for them to, to be curious without being afraid that this would be a stupid question. I don't want to raise my hand. Someone else might think that, uh, that I should know the answer or whatever. And at the same time, spending some time in silence, it can be extremely uh, valuable. So what happens here is that when the uh, jam closes, uh, you get this word cloud and it's uh, interactive. So what I typically do if I have more time is that I ask people if there are some of these questions or some of these words that they are curious about. So let's say as, uh, I'm curious about the uh, plagiarism, uh, uh, even though I don't know how to uh, pronounce that either. So I can click it and then I can see all the questions and answers, including that word. How can I help faculty stop being the plagiarism police with AI? It's a matter of resourcing. How can I help? It's the same. Um, revise for another person. And that, you, you know, you can use question DM to ask the same question several times with different people. Um, learning is another word. You can click. Um, so, so you can see all the questions and answers. I think you also got um, on your screen, you got a, an opportunity of uh, putting in your email and then you can receive all the questions uh, and answers uh, in, your, uh, in your inbox. So, and you can download the data here. And you can click here to see all the questions and answers. And it is a facilitating tool as well. So you can use that both to, you know, in if you have time in the class to go through some of this and address some of the questions, but also uh, to, um, to prepare for another session. And what we can see is that, that people, um, people use this for very different uh, things. Um, they use it for uh, preparing for a new topic, maybe. Uh, it can also be that they use it to, um, to, to share, um, you know, questions afterwards the session. So there are different, but I guess uh, it would be better to talk to uh, Maha and other users about that because, as I said, I'm not an educator, so I don't know how it makes best sense for you to use it. Uh, we are just, you know, uh, what we hear, 
um, are some of these things. And as I said, it is uh, free, uh, questionjam.com. You just sign up for an account. It is as simple as you saw. There is there's no nothing more to it. Um, so you can just do it if you want to. Uh, Bonnie's asking about the limit 50, I think you said. Uh, no, yeah, but there's just not a real limit. It's there is no a... limit. It's just, you know, I've done it with up to 120 people or something like that. Uh, so more than four people typically mm, I, irene is asking about yeah first of all meg is asking can you share your slides and oh, irene is asking uh so if i don't know if they're on powerpoint offline or if they're somewhere with a link because i don't i don't have everybody's email who's gonna who's been in the session so i don't know how you're gonna share them but irene is also asking for the next session can we have more time to explain how to join the app to those who have not used it before. This is where if you had an incognito window open at the same time, that might yes, have yes, just yes. demonstrated that. So, um, I'll do that next time. We, Whenever we do this again, we'll, we'll make sure that we do the incognito window. I'm sorry, this was, uh, I had way more stuff than uh, than <laughs> was fit for 90 minutes uh, and, and you were, Fortunately, you were way more engaged than I hoped uh, <laughs> there to hope. So, so we, it was a bit um, compromised. I'm I'm sorry. Oh, I, I, I wouldn't say compromised. I would say you were responsive to to what people wanted, the direction okay. people wanted the session to take. And I think we got to play with Question Jam, and yeah. you kept us hungry for more. So we have more questions and answers, which is good. That is good. That's how we <laughs> develop. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. So if, if you guys want to see uh, more from Pia, what would you like her to focus on? Because I've seen several people say we'd like more. So what would you like to do more of? Thank you, everyone. And I, oh, we forgot that we, we actually have a session for getting feedback, uh, a form for getting feedback, but I don't know where it is. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll send it to e by email to everyone who's been participating in MyFest so that we can get feedback on all the sessions we've had so far because I don't have it ready right now. But if you'd like to say something in the chat about what you'd like to learn more about, you can organize another one. I think I will stop share so I can see you guys. That was nice. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just more. <laughs> I just have one comment for Pia. I don't know if she knows Egyptians, but uh, we no. have some very common here in Egypt. I, and I usually face that when someone is asking a question, it's not for me to answer. He's asking the question for him to answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so ask, he, asking a question to answer yourself? No, no, usually, usually when we have I like lots of people that I meet, they ask me a question, mm -hmm. not for me to answer, for they to talk, for mm. them to talk. Mm. But you didn't mention this in the categories, so I'm just adding this to your categories. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I, I, I have a, a whole other uh, session about how we can use uh, questions for bad, <laughs> how we use questions to manipulate and how we use questions yeah, to monopolize and to, um, <laughs> I just find more energy in how we can, you know, use questions to, to actually do something together that we would not be able to do alone. I think that's the true power of questions that it, it connects us and, and enables us to, yeah, to yeah, do amazing this, things. Yeah. This will be interesting. So yeah, there seems to be interest in, you know, how do you, like what you just said there, Pia, and about curiosity and overcoming all the cultural power structures that dampen curiosity. Yes. Um, I think what I'd like, you know what I'd like to do based on this? I'd like to start a session with a question jam mm -hmm. and end a session with a question jam. So the people have two opportunities to use question jam at the beginning and at the end. And then we talk about questions in the middle. We can look at some of the questions that we come up with and talk about what that is. And then look at the questions we come up with at the end as well. And so I think that would be really, I mean, I, I, I only use it in my class one time because they said they like interacting face-to-face -face and they don't want to interact online. But when we're fully online, I love this because of 
followers. Look at what Bonnie just said. She said this was so life-giving. Oh, really nice. So Pia, you don't know Bonnie, but Bonnie has this big podcast called, Te called Teaching in Higher Education that a lot of educators listen to. And she sometimes, I'm not going to say. She can say if she wants. <laughs> but she's, she's a really known podcaster. <laughs> I don't want to embarrass her or put her on the spot. But yeah. That sounds wonderful. I will definitely give that a listen to that. Mm. Thank you. Oh yeah, Bonnie put a, put the link to your podcast. In the book. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. All right. Thank it? you, everybody. Uh, I think I'm it is. Yes. Thank you so I much, Pia. Reach out. Reach out if thank you, Pia. Thank you very much.